you very much for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to join this uh, conference. I have to apologize because in the title that I submitted, that was the, uh, there was a mistake and I corrected it, but the old version was submitted. So then, so I thought then I have it here because it says and elastic bodies falling in a viscous fluid, but then I realized on this thing five minutes ago, I realized I had forgotten from 1781. So this is a very bad start. It can only get better, I hope, <laughs> during the lecture. So I will report about uh, the work of Lagrange from um, uh, 1781. Uh, this is published in the uh, memoirs of the Academy of Berlin, where he was professor since 1766. And um, in, this, in this work, there are three new topics. One is the, he derives the equation of the fluid's velocity on a material surface. Second, he derives the potential equations of gas dynamics, also for the first time. And third, he writes down the equations for shallow water waves. And one, uh, which is maybe a bit unfair, they are interesting by themselves, but. Uh, And uh, the others I take here as preparatory steps toward that, towards that goal. Okay, when you are uh, equation of the fluid's velocity on the material surface, uh, you consider you consider a fluid a fluid uh, like this. You have. You, you, you have a solid boundary here below. I can use also this thing. You have a, you have a solid boundary here below and you have, uh, say this is rock or whatever, sand, and then there is water above it. And then you have a surface that separates the water here, the blue one, that separates the water from, uh, the, uh, from the air above. So you have two uh, surfaces here that separate the fluid from uh, some other material. It is possible this year with the rock, we consider that uh, not, not moving, but of course this year in general will be moving. And in particular in the cases, in the case that I have in mind with the shallow water theory, then this is the main point to uh, get, get this. And then, um, ah. Is better now? Yeah, okay. So, so uh, but of course, this one here, this surface above, uh, that, that, um, uh, that uh, will change its shape in time, and then the question is, what does the, what does the velocity do at such a surface? The idea, the idea he has is this. Uh, if you fix if you fix some particle that is in the surface, say you take a particle x which is in the surface and then you let it go. Take it as and x is x, y and z. And then you let it go. Then of course um, for x of t this equation must hold. And if you differentiate everything with respect to t then you arrive at this uh, partial differential equation of first order. And this is, so to speak, the, uh, the a, a kinematic condition on such a boundary that may move. The assumption on which, on which uh, Lagrange proceeds here is that if you take, 
you look again at the, at the picture here, he, he assumes that um, the situation is like this. This boundary, the points that are in this boundary, they remain in the boundary all the time because, he says, the fluid body cannot divide into several parts. And also, this thing here cannot come down. We think it is some sort of wave. It cannot come down and make this uh, into a ho hollow thing inside. That's not possible. So uh, this is a perfectly clear uh, derivation which he makes. And um, so we have uh, equation. We have equation number one. He then remarks. We have heard that in the talk by Professor Hildebrand before. He then remarks that this is an equation, which I have here. He remarks that this is an equation he has considered before uh, uh, per se, equation of this type. But uh, he does not go into details, because uh, in this paper from 1781, he will use is the uh, kinematic condition on a moving boundary. Okay. Then for the next for the next piece that he uh, recalls the continuity equation and the equation of motion. This here is the equation of motion is the uh, conservation of, of momentum, what you do here. So you have the material derivative of the fluid, of the fluid's velocity, plus 1 over rho times the gradient of the pressure, and that equals, uh, where is my thing? And that, and that equals, are uh, here. And that equals uh, F. And now he says, okay, if F is uh, uh, a potential force is the gradient of some uh, scale of function, then I can show that also V must be the, uh, the uh, uh, gradient of velocity of a velocity potential. Uh, the the uh, transformation he does is uh, the following trick. On both sides, he uh, subtracts the term 1 over 2 gradient of v squared. And of course, if you calculate this, this is 0. So if you have that on both sides, then you have on, the, uh, on, on this side here, this is then gone. And you have only this piece here, uh, d 1 over rho times dp. He assumes that, that is uh, special in his case, but you can do also for more general uh, conditions. He assumes that p is a linear function of rho. So then, of course, this, uh, this 1 over rho dp is the gradient of k times logarithm of rho. And then you see you have all, uh, you, you have everywhere um, uh, uh, gradients, and you end up with equation number 4. So he, uh, this is what he gets from the equation of motion. K times logarithm of rho is V minus d phi dt minus 1 over 2 uh, square root of phi. Because this V here is the gradient of phi. You insert there. Okay, this he uses, uh, this uh, uh, he uses now in the, in the next equation, in the continuity equation. And this is now an, a new derivation. This is the continuity equation for a, um, for a fluid which, is, uh, which has not constant uh, density. And um, you insert, in this case, you insert for V d phi, then you, then you calculate this expression to divide everything by rho in order to get, again, a, a piece where you can use this k times logarithm of rho, and you end up with this here. And now you see we have k times logarithm of rho here and here. So we, we can insert that, uh, the equation I had before, number 4. And what you get then is this equation down here. This 2 is wrong. This equation down here. And this is the, the, uh, continu this is the uh, 
a potential equation for gas dynamics. Once more, uh, in the way he derives it, I, 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 he had this special uh, law, but the reasoning would be the same if you have a power law there. You can also use that. It would not, it would not be a big problem. Now what can one, uh, what can one say ab about, this, uh, about this equation? Uh, there also, already at that time, as it is today, there are some, uh, some sort of controversial uh, uh, discussion about, about velocity potentials and potential flow. For instance, Euler, uh, I, I should say, it should start like this. Uh, if you have the easiest case, namely that rho is constant, then you have, you have divergence of V is zero. Divergence of V is zero looks very easy, but it is, when you want to make examples, it is a really a big obstacle. I think the, if you compare uh, a, a nonlinear uh, problem like the Navier Stokes equations and you, you compare it with the minimal surfaces, you have very many examples for minimal surfaces, but only a few, and rather trivial things for the Navier Stokes equations. And the point is, you cannot handle this uh, divergence free. The, this, the, the, the problem that V must be divergence free. So as soon as you start, is, you, you have to do very simple assumptions. So uh, one, one coordinate of V does not depend on one coordinate of space and things like that. And you end up always with almost trivial things. So there is not much. Uh, that is a, uh, it's very hard to get. Uh, uh, explicit solutions for this. Therefore, to use a potential in this context was a, a help because you know every a harmonic function, if you take the gradient, that is a solution of this. So, as I said, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, 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 now controversial whether you can use it or not. Euler, for instance, considered potential, uh, potential flows not as uh, a very realistic model. He thought more of it as a mathematically interesting uh, uh, piece, and also maybe of some uh, of some uh, uh, limiting case. Uh, Others thought differently. As, as so, it is also uh, it is also uh, today. But um, we, in this in this uh, context here, here, you will see later. It, it is uh, it is very helpful to go through. Uh, when you, when you look into more recent literature, for instance, John von Neumann says uh, potential flow, irrotational potential flow applies only to one material, and that material is dry water. So he says it's nonsense. On the other hand, there is a long historic paper by Dan Joseph from 2006, and he reports about a uh, potential flow for viscous fluids. And he, said, uh, he had spent all of his life in hydrodynamics and aerodynamics, and he knows uh, very well what is going on there. And he says, we have to be careful. There are, there are examples where you can use it, and it is very good to use it, and there are other situations where it is not. It is certainly true that most of the mathematical results that have been shown for this do not apply to any real flow. But nevertheless, in other cases, it is good. So we, we, uh, we are careful and look what will come out here uh, with Lagrange. Uh, he himself says uh, uh, he can think of, um, of a, a, a flow that behaves like this. He said it must be an impulse. And once the flow is potential flow, then it continues to be one. Well, okay, but uh, he does not tell us how this impulse is now carried out precisely. So uh, it is not clear to me what he had in mind. And, uh, uh, but uh, we will see for, what, for the, the thing that, uh, that will come later, we will see that it is very helpful to, to have this. So uh, the, the, this is then the... the uh, equation of uh, gas dynamics and um, the potential equation of gas dynamics and it appears uh, here uh, for the first time. As I mentioned before, 
he, he, and as I showed you, he starts from the equation of motion and introduces there the uh, velocity potential and not from the very easiest uh, case of the continuity equation divergence v equals zero and comes there to potential. So there, that was his uh, approach to the things and so he ended with this. Th of course this is a nonlinear uh, equation and there is no, no hope to get some um, uh, some uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, examples that solve this, but when you linearize, uh, he discusses various uh, things. Uh, but this is something I will, I will not, uh, I will not carry out now. Now, how does he go to the main step? Uh, the main step, if you recall the picture from before, the main step is now this. Uh, and that is, uh, that is an, uh, an interesting, uh, I think, a very interesting point. You see, uh, it, it, the way I have uh, made it here, that if this is the z direction, the domain is very small in z direction compared to the other ones. And so, uh, and uh, if eventually, uh, one makes the, one makes the, uh, the domain in z direction infinitely small uh, and, and gets uh, equations and this is a this is a, a, a method I will come later to to it that uh, is carried out uh, in in all in, in, in very many cases in hydrodynamics in particular either you make the you make the, the domain like uh, I will show you here you make it infinitely small or you make it infinitely large if you compare, if you look at the, um, you, you want to know the resistance of a body in a flow, then you say there is this body and outside there is nothing. It's the whole space of R3 is filled with fluid. You do that in order to uh, have no influence of walls from your wind tunnel or whatever it is where you uh, would do the experiment. Okay, so he, what he does here is he says, uh, let's make that uh, very small, and he makes an ansatz for the um, he makes an ansatz for the uh, potential and for the pressure, and by saying that there uh, you can uh, develop the function as a, a power series in Z with uh, coefficients phi n that depend only on x, y, and t, and the same for the pressure. If you do that, if you do that, you get, you, you reduce your problem in the following way. Uh, it is clear these two, these uh, uh, two derivatives with respect to z, they, they have then in front the, um, the coefficient, uh, the, the coefficient phi2 if you have the, if you apply the derivatives respect to, with respect to x and y to the coefficient. So if you uh, take a harmonic function then, and then you rearrange uh, terms, then you get always linear combinations like this in, uh, where you have uh, where, where Laplace prime is the Laplace operator in the first two um, uh, uh, variables and um, and in the uh, last variable, of course, it's a differentiation of z to the power n. Uh, you, you get powers of z. And that means you can write, uh, if this is zero, then all the coefficients have to, have to vanish. So that means you can write phi2 in terms of phi0 and phi3 in terms of uh, phi1. And then phi4, of course, in terms of phi2, but phi2 you could write already in terms of phi0. So you end up with a, with a, a formula that allows you to uh, express all the coefficients just by the first two. So they are given functions. Once you have the first two, then the, the, all the others are given functions uh, uh, and are known functions there. The, the, the uh, expression is complicated, but that's another, that's another business. Okay, when you do this, when you do this, 
Ah, then we have on the. We, this is. I start with the kinematic condition on the lower boundary. It says, of course, that the fluid cannot penetrate. So um, it means that the the, the, the gradient. Uh, the, the, the normal component oh, is, is zero, and this is what it means. So when you have z equal to alpha, that was, you remember, the lower boundary, then, uh, then you have uh, this equation. And now, because Lagrange does the same, I call phi zero, I call phi prime, and phi one, I call phi double prime. Then you can insert this, uh, this uh, uh, expression from before into this equation, and then you get an uh, you, you you get an uh, equation, of course, with very high derivatives here, but only in phi prime and phi double prime, and of course with powers of alpha. These are the the z powers, right? The powers of alpha. So this is uh, what he gets when he inserts his uh, uh, formula into the into the um, kinematic boundary condition. The next step which he does is on the free boundary on the free boundary is is given by p equals zero. We assume that the air above uh, the, the water that the, the pressure there is zero and on the free boundary you have the uh, you, you have uh, the uh, the uh, other condition that dp dt plus dp dp is zero. This, if you plug in everything as from the uh, expansions from before, uh, this gives now a very long uh, expression. Lagrange always writes the first and the second and then he leaves it to you to do the other ones, but it's not hard uh, to, to carry that out. And uh, again, if you look here, the phi appear only twice, phi prime and phi, phi double prime and phi prime, nothing else. And of course you have the, the uh, function p in it. So uh, the next step, uh, uh, that w I wanted to write this, um, the next step is this. Uh, now I consider, now I consider the, uh, maybe I should do that here, huh? Now I consider the terms up to up to four, uh, uh, sec, uh, zero and first order. This is what he does. So on this assumption, uh, when I have this, there is one term I get phi prime. I get phi, phi double prime plus dx alpha d phi prime dx plus d dy alpha d phi prime dy. This is one equation I get on sigma equals z, uh, on, on sigma which is, means z is equal to, uh, uh, to uh, alpha. For the pressure I take P is P prime plus P double prime Z. And then I stop. Ah, no, no other terms are involved here. And uh, when you insert this, when you insert the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, from before, the things from before, then you get the following. P prime is G, this is now gravity, this is the only force that, that x is x times e1 plus y times e2. e is e1, e2, e3, but gravity is pointing downward. So this is 0, 0, 1, there is nothing. And then you have minus is the, the equation from before, d phi, my, d phi by dt minus 1 half d phi prime squared and um, then plus other plus higher terms but we leave them out we only have a uh, 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 first order the same is for this p double prime and i will come to this later what that means 
physically. This is g times e3, this is 1. And then, again, higher order terms, so we leave out. So you see, this here is 0, these two things plus this. This is the pressure you insert there. And um, when you take them all together, when you take them all together, you get the following. And this is then the equation. It, it is d dt squared equals g times alpha minus e phi prime dt minus one half e phi squared times gradient Laplacian of phi prime plus g e phi times e alpha minus e phi times e squared phi times e phi prime, always with prime. Okay, and this is now the equation of the shallow water theory, equation for shallow water. Now I have to say something about this. Shallow water theory. Okay. Uh, first, I want to remark is this. Um, this is again, as we had it with the potential equation for gas dynamics, this is again a, a, a non complicated nonlinear equation. So, what he does is he takes only the linear things. Ah, here's a, a prime. So, he take on, takes only the linear part, that is this one here. And from this bracket here, he takes the g alpha, not this product. So you take this one here, g alpha times Laplacian phi prime, and then you leave out this. So if you do that, and you take them together, this here gradient phi with this above, then you get the following. You get um, a d squared uh, d squared phi prime divided by d squared equal g times divergence of alpha phi prime. Okay, and if now you assume that the bottom of the of your reservoir is flat, it would even it would even become simpler. You have the wave equation. G alpha is now a constant. La plus phi. So, and uh, this is uh, this is an, an important step. Uh, what he does now, for the following reason, uh, of course, the wave equation was known before from the work of D'Alembert, uh, Euler by himself. The wave equation was known for uh, for sound wave, the propagation of sound, but the, the uh, rarefaction and concentration of the material in the sound waves uh, you cannot see. So they always, when they talked about it, they always said, well, this is a wave phenomenon because they saw some periodic uh, thing in it. This is a wave phenomenon like water waves because water waves was something everyone knew. Here for the first time, uh, Lagrange derives the equation and says, yes, uh, it is a it is a wave equation. The, the water waves behave uh, according to this uh, equation. And now he, he said, now I can use all the mathematical uh, devices that I know already from uh, the theory of sound, the propagation of sound. I can use it to analyze further this here. So uh, I think that is the, that is the first step, uh, uh, the, the first point in his, uh, in his uh, uh, derivation of the shallow water waves, which is uh, uh, truly interesting. So they appear there for the first time. Then there is another point, uh, which is, uh, which one, which I think is not uh, evident that he does this. I, I turn this back and I come to this here. You see, he makes the assumption the pressure is like this, and then I stop. Okay, why does he that? Why does he do this? He said, well, I have an expansion, 
right? That all these terms, and uh, I take now the first, and then the second, and then the third. And in later on, in, in his book, for instance, he says, oh, I did not have time to do all the steps. Well, you can imagine when you see how complicated that is, it is clear <laughs> that, uh, that it is a big, uh, a big uh, problem to you to, to uh, evaluate them in full generality. But, uh, uh, but still, it is important in principle. He does, he does this by equating these things and saying, OK, this is the first term, this is the second, and this is the third. You could also argue like this, and this is standard argument in hydrodynamics. You could say, well, I take, I take the pressure like this. This is the hydrostatic, this is the, like in the hydrostatic case. I take the pressure in the hydrostatic case because the um, accelerations are that small anyway uh, that it is not important. Uh, once you do that, uh, it, is, uh, it, it can work that uh, you will not run into trouble, but it must not always be the case. There are examples, and I will come to this, uh, where, where it's truly uh, uh, where, where, where you run into big problems when you do that. So uh, in his whole reasoning, there is never an argument like this, that he argues with physical uh, properties. Uh, well, I said he has the idea that there is an impulse and that uh, generates a fluid motion, uh, so that, that is a potential flow, but uh, this is not a part of the derivation. He always he is very strict uh, formally in these things. And I believe that this, is a, uh, that this is an important point. I give you, yeah, first of all, uh, uh, why, is, uh, why, is the, uh, uh, why is this good? Um, the shallow water theory, or, or water waves in general, and then in particular also shallow water theory, that was a, um, a topic studied at the Courant Institute in the uh, after the war from 45 to 55 uh, by Stoker, Friedrichs, Friedrichs and Levy, Friedrichs and Hayes, many, uh, many authors. And uh, uh, most of the results are collected in Stoker's book. And when you look into Stoker's book, he says the uh, shallow water theory starts with Lagrange. That is what he says on page number one. And, uh, and it is interesting that in one of his papers, one of his papers from 48, there is an appendix of six pages by Kurt Otto Friedrichs. And Friedrichs points out uh, this reasoning with small, uh, small um, derivatives and, 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 and small accelerations and things like that. This is not good. We would like to know precisely the approximation scheme for the water waves, and then what Friedrich does is uh, he uses another parameter, is in principle the same reasoning as Lagrange again. So, uh, uh, so I think uh, if they had in mind that this is not uh, uh, that this is worthwhile, uh, the, the effort, then uh, we, we should uh, we should uh, say that it's also a very good point uh, in in Lagrange's work. And, uh, now, I said that this is dangerous to, uh, to use such uh, approximations, in particular when you have in the first place an assumption on the, on the domain. Either the domain is infinitely small or infinitely large. And I can give you one example uh, where, this is, uh, where this is known. It is from... Um, uh, it is from uh, the uh, flow around uh, a solid body or flow around a cylinder, in, if you take the two-dimensional case. Uh, the point is this. When you, when you look how Stokes, in 1845, derived the resistance formula for sphere, Stokes had the following uh, idea. You have a, you have a sphere and you have outside nothing else but fluid. And that fluid moves with constant velocity towards that sphere. And then in the equation, you have two points, two pieces. You have this nonlinearity, which we saw before, and you have the other, the other part is the 
the viscous forces. Now take this one here. So, then he says, okay, the, uh, I assume the flow is slow, that the acceleration is small compared to the uh, viscous forces, and that it gives a linearization, gives Stokes equations, and on the basis of this he could calculate the resistance formula and is in perfect agreement with reality, with what you measure. However, when you look careful and when you evaluate his solution for large values of x, because he, as I said, he has this infinite domain, for large values of x, then this thing is not only not small, it goes to infinity, for x to infinity. So that means the solution that he obtains contradicts the assumptions under which you derive the equation. In his case, it, it didn't do any harm, but it tells you, you better be careful. Uh, it could go the other way around. Okay, when you, uh, then later on, people uh, investigated the two-dimensional case. Well, then Stokes' equations is even harder and even worse. It looked at the two-dimensional case, and uh, so you have, imagine a cylinder, and then of arbitrary cross-section, and then the flow around that cylinder. And then they had another linearization, Hussein's linearization, you li don't linearize at zero, but you linearize at a constant vector. So, okay. And then they did this, and they came up, when they calculated the moment, they came up and said, uh, that doesn't work, there's a paradox here, because there is a term that grows logarithmically. You can imagine the solution is defined on an infinite domain, and when you calculate forces and so on, you have always integrals either over boundary that becomes larger and larger or over the whole uh, domain. And so they got, an, they got an, uh, a logarithmic singularity. And that, was, that was Philon in 25. Okay. So uh, about 30 years later, a Japanese physicist uh, did what... Uh, uh, what I su suggested before. He said, okay, I don't care about any physical arguments. I take the, uh, the approximation up to an order, say, three, and then I calculate all these things. Okay, he did, and he found the, he found the, uh, uh, the logarithmic singularity, and he found the second one. And the second one had the opposite sign. So there was no singularity. That was it. M with other words, the Physical reasoning led to uh, wrong results, and just by, uh, but it's a long paper and a lot of work, what he did, so he succeeded in this. Okay, so I think, uh, I think uh, uh, it, there is some point uh, in it that one, uh, this one is careful uh, with approximations. As I said, sometimes they're okay, they don't do any harm, and sometimes they are not, and uh, you don't know you don't know before uh, what, uh, what goes on. By the way, uh, the first one, as I said, it is common in hydrodynamics that uh, you take, in order to simplify things, you take uh, your domain to be infinite, which of course is not, uh, is not, is not so in reality. Uh, the first one who did that, uh, well, you might not think, but the first one was Archimedes. So we have this here. 2300th birthday of Archimedes in his uh, treatise on floating bodies he did not have any uh, device what the boundaries of your say what the, and I want to, to, uh, to determine the, the pressure here on the bottom of that thing he, he did not know what to do with the boundary right uh, of course, uh, the hydrostatics, uh, one knows that the boundary does not have any effect, it's just the height. But he did not have this. Uh, he did not know this, so what he said is, I formulate my uh, law only for such fluids which are not contained in anything. Not contained in anything. And then he said, what does it look like if I have nothing, just this fluid body? Then he says, this fluid body is a ball, a great big ball, and the center of this is the center of the Earth. So, you can, so this is what he did. 
And when he then makes his, uh, uh, his uh, when he formulates this principle in the first book of these two books on floating bodies, it is always uh, with this curved surface. Only in the second part, when he looks at uh, paraboloids and things and discusses how they float, then the separating surface is flat. But in the first, when he starts out, it is, uh, it is always a big sphere. And also the pictures he makes are all spherical. So this is, of course, something you can imagine at that time. Uh, I think most people did not realize uh, what he had in mind. Uh, and uh, it is interesting, now I come here, I've, I've been away from Lagrange, but Lagrange complains at one, in another paper uh, on hydrodynamics, he complains about the bad translations of the classics. I, I can imagine he did not think of translations into English or uh, into uh, Italian or French, that was not the point. Fact is that this book, by, for instance, uh, I do not know whether he had this book of Archimedes in mind, but there I can show you what it means with the bad translations. The, uh, the, um, the, this book by Archimedes uh, was found in the Palimpsest 1907 in Constantinople by Heiberg. Before, there were only, uh, there were only translations either into Latin or into Arabic. And uh, here in the most, uh, I, I don't know where, who could read Arab, but uh, uh, here the Latin translation uh, was used. And this Latin translation was made by uh, Willem van Moerbeek. Uh, van Moerbeek, Moerbeek is a uh, village in, in Brabant. And Willem van Moerbeek was, a, uh, he, w he joined the Dominican order, studied in Cologne with Albertus Magnus, and he's known for the fact that he went to Greece, learned Greek, and he translated all of uh, Aristoteles. That was the main point. And when he was finished with that, he also translated Archimedes and other classical writers. And that was the only thing available. Now, so the manuscripts existed at that time? No, no the, 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 the palimpsest, but it was not known. It was a palimpsest. Yeah, but what did he translate on? What Greek text did he have? Oh, uh, I, no one knows. No, no, no one knows. Uh, there were certainly Greek texts, but I, I don't know. But the one he had, in the one he had, uh, you know, now we now have from Heiberg, from Heiberg we have a, um, we have a, um, the, in Bibliotheca Teutneriana we have a critical edition with with all the with with all the things in the margin, and I can. I, uh, yeah, I can show you here uh, what happened. What happened with this? When, when he did, you see, only part, Heiberg could read only parts. So he starts out in Greek, then it stops. He continues in Latin. So, so because he had only parts. But the main point is this here: uh, the, the Latin is uh, easier. Nisi humidum vase aliquo continuator. If not, the fluid is contained in some. Uh, container vases, but when you look at the in the apparatus criticus, I don't know the English word for it. When you look, then it says this this not nisi this not is me this this no me. It says down here it says uh, me has the codex C. This is the one Heiberg found. <laughs> the Arabs have it, but omisit b. This is the codex, uh, the Latin codex from. Uh, uh, from Van Moerbeke, and now uh, that was uh, that was the one everyone could, I hope everyone could see uh, in, in in Europe. So you can imagine, he says, oh, it must be the fluid must be contained in a container like this. Therefore, the law holds. Next step, the fluid is a body which is a, a ball as big as the Earth, and the center is the center of the Earth. That doesn't make make sense. So this is certainly one uh, one point where the, uh, the, the translation was very bad. I do not know whether uh, Lagrange had this in mind, but there are many other, uh, uh, there are many other uh, uh, mistakes of this type. So you can, you can uh, look into them. OK. So much for, the, uh, for this. Uh, when I was asked uh, to uh, join this conference and give a lecture, it was said that I should also, uh, or could also report on some 
recent work uh, on hydrodynamics, and this is uh, I will do uh, very very briefly, and I will speak about this. Uh, about this, uh, it is uh, on the steady motion of a coupled system solid liquid. It is the fall of a elastic body in a viscous fluid, and uh, it is recent in the sense that it has still not appeared in print, but only online uh, 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 as memoirs of the AMS. But we, we did this 2009 when Paolo Galdi was uh, Mercato professor in Aachen, and, and Mats Key is uh, uh, assistant and a postdoc uh, in Aachen. So, and we look at the following thing. This is again a sort of uh, a, yeah, is a free boundary problem. We look at the following problem. You have an elastic body in some stress-free configuration. You have a constant body force. It can also be uh, gravity. And you have a viscous incompressible fluid outside of your elastic thing. And then you ask, is there a reference frame F such that there is a stationary configuration in that frame. You can imagine if this is some body uh, that will not just sink down, it could, could turn around and do all sorts of things. And we ask, is there a reference frame such that in, in this frame the configuration is stationary? Uh, the result, the, the result uh, the results I write, uh, I write down like this. Maybe I should make one. Maybe I should do one more uh, drawing. Uh, uh, the result is like this. Either we, we start with, uh, with C. That's the, the simplest. We start with C. It, it depends on the shape of this thing, on the symmetry in particular of this thing. Either it falls down like this, doesn't rotate nothing, just a translation. That's possible. Or it falls down, but it rotates around an axis through the center of mass of this body. Or it rotates, but the center of mass moves on a helix uh, uh, downward. These three cases can occur. This is the one we, we, we find. And now you can, now you can look at it from two, from two points. Either you say, well, this is a free boundary problem for the Nazi Stokes equations. It's one thing. Or you say, okay, this is a free traction problem of nonlinear elasticity. And free traction problems, that means problems where you have the equations of nonlinear elasticity. And you have on the boundary, you do not prescribe uh, the shape and then ask what is the deformation inside, but you apply forces on the outside, on the, on the, uh, uh, the boundary of this elastic body. And when you do this, you, you have always compatibility conditions. So see, I wrote down the, this is the boundary condition, and that will be the stress vector of the fluid in our case. But forget this. There must be a, must be a, a vector g. There must be a vector. Oh, these are all vectors. Sorry. You have a compatibility condition. Um, uh, uh, which involves also the deformation phi, which involves the solution. And that makes it very hard to, to, to treat this problem. Uh, there is a, in particular from the Italian school that goes, these problems go back to uh, Signorini, and uh, in particular in the Italian school, there are very many contributions uh, to this. Uh, you can see them in the books by uh, Valent and Crioli. Uh, but these are not the only contributors to it. Uh, and uh, it is in particular, uh, uh, it is in particular uh, the, the question, how do we deal with this compatibility condition? Uh, yeah, one way is, one way is that you, that you introduce, that you introduce um, uh, a dead load. Ah, before I say what that is, I say something else. 50 years ago, by the way, there was a conference 150 years after Lagrange in Torino. Torino. And uh, there, uh, Fikera lectured on uh, the, um, 
problem such, uh, posed by Signorini, uh, where you have an, in an inequality, so unilateral constraint in the problem. And uh, I, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that Signorini also with this other problem, which, uh, which uh, was then solved, that he, what he had it, that he had in mind something with the free traction problem, because that uh, obviously was in the 30s for him. He formulated very carefully these things, was a, a, a problem of, of, of importance. Yeah, uh, but may that as it uh, be, uh, you can handle things when you have a so-called dead load. Uh, the, the other thing would then be a life load. What is a dead load? Well, for F, F is independent of the particular transformation. Remember, in the compatibility condition, there's always this phi inside. That therefore, you cannot say what to do with it. Uh, then you have, uh, for instance, gravity. That is a dead load. So perfect. Uh, condition for G. Condition for G if G is identically zero. So if you have, like it's a unilateral constraint, you have this thing sitting here, this object, nothing, the outside does nothing to it, that, you, that is a dead load. But for instance, a centrifugal force, you take the, take the, the um, uh, elastic body, you rotate it, of course, then you have centrifugal forces tearing it outside. This is not a dead load, and it's a rather simple device, I should say. Uh, but as I said, this is not a dead load. The uh, other thing, the pressure for G, uh, when you, G is the, the, the force on the boundary. If you have a, a deflated balloon, say of finite thickness, an elastic thing, and you increase the pressure inside, it's also a very simple device. Huh? This is not a dead load. So you, when you restrict yourself to dead loads, then uh, uh, you're, you're not, you cannot cover such cases. Okay, so this is the background, the background of this, and you know, in this problem, in this problem that we have in mind, uh, I show you once more the compatibility condition. You see, this thing here. This look at this from the right, the, this part here. This is this is somehow a moment, right, which has to be equal to some other moment, and then it is in equilibrium. So we take this. As the con not as a condition, an additional condition, and say, oh, how can we uh, uh, satisfy this? But we take it as a condition that tells us what the center of mass does and how it, uh, how it, uh, how the, the the rotation of the thing does. So, in this sense, we integrate this condition into the whole setup. And when when you do this, I have not said for what type of. Uh, objects, what geometries, the thing works, you have to, you have to uh, introduce, uh, you have to use a concept which was introduced by, I, I will be done in one minute. We have a concept which was introduced by Hans Weinberger when he investigated falling bodies in the Stokes uh, fluid. And this goes like this. You take isolated direction of fall. It's, uh, there are, uh, there, there are uh, objects for which you can, with which you can define an isolated direction of fall. Now this looks horrible, but when I tell you in words what it is, it is not so complicated. So this is the Stokes equations, right? And the Stokes equations either on the E is the exterior of your object, sigma is the boundary of your object, and on the boundary. You either take uh, a, a unit vector, E1, E2, E3, or you take the unit vector, the cross product with the vector x. And then you have three unit vectors, so all together you have six uh, equations and six solutions. Okay. And then you, then you, you, you write down these, these quantities. Now, T is the the, this is the stress. This is the stress uh, vector. So, so, so the, physically, this component is the force exerted on this body, right? One, the I then measures the uh, component into one, two, three directions, and the J tells you what, what, what uh, boundary value you had here. So these are then altogether nine. And uh, the same 
you do here with a moment. Here it is with a, with a moment x cross product with a stress vector. Okay, then you get four matrices. Okay, and now it comes. Ah, then you perform the following. Then you perform the following thing. You you take this matrix. This is T minus. Uh, it's a long story why it is like this, and you find out if A has a simple eigenvalue, then the corresponding direction of fall, uh, the, co the corresponding eigenvector is the direction of fall, and this, this eigenvalue tells you the, the, the rotational speed. So, uh, so uh, when we say this, uh, uh, this uh, we can solve this, of course, these are local solutions. Right, because it's a long approximation scheme that one could say a lot of this about this. But the main point is that this here is, of course, uh, uh, to, to calculate these things is, of course, uh, not, not so easy. Uh, there, there are uh, examples uh, one can do. For instance, you take two, uh, two uh, thin disks and then you tilt them. Uh, and this thing you can take uh, that it falls down in this and in so you, you can calculate all these things. But it is not the case that I could tell you for any object you give me uh, whether it is a, an object with uh, it has a, 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 an isolated direction of fall or not. The problem is we have to go through uh, approximations and therefore uh, this, this uh, direction of fall that has to be to, in this sense isolated. Uh, it, it, it adjusts itself always that this is one direction of fall otherwise you're uh, your approximations will never converge, and for the uh, more uh, for the more uh, uh, symmetric things, for instance, if, the, if it, you have a, a rotational symmetry, uh, symmetry, uh, say by a uh, three-bladed propeller, symmetric by a um, uh, by an angle of 120 degrees, that would fall down and rotate. If uh, if the thing is rotational symmetric with respect to an axis, it would just fall down, would not rotate at all. But these things do not come out of this as special cases. You have to do the whole uh, existence theorem again in special uh, um, function spaces. OK. So uh, this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yeah. This isolated directions of form. Are they in some sense stable? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, uh, they are uh, that, that is also something we have to exploit. So if you, if you have one thing, you perturb it, then it remains the same. Yes, yes, that's, that's true. That's true. And it can happen that we have one object with three different isolated directions of fall. And in, in one, it just moves down. And in another one, it goes on a helix. That one can also calculate. But you see, the, you must be able to, to, um, to, to uh, express the, these quantities from the, from the force and from the moment of the solution of Stokes equation. And uh, when you, uh, so wha wha how one argues then is this. I have one um, uh, uh, somewhat thick uh, circular thing here and one here. Then I assume this one does not influence the other one. The line in between is small, does not influence the flow at all. On this basis, you get this. Uh, otherwise, uh, it is just, uh, it's just no. You have to have, for this, you, you have to always come up with some explicit solution. Otherwise, it's hopeless. And you can do that for, yeah, for tilted uh, circular disk, and you can do that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have one historical question. Yeah. I found it very interesting that you told us about shallow water rates. And maybe I can uh, connect your lecture with Professor Ward's lecture yesterday. Hans Levy showed me once a paper on this where he gave the proof of Le Rampas and Gauss's like Hardik reciprocity law in number theory, yeah. I shall water this. Ah, I didn't know that. One I of the 19, or oh, I don't know how many books. Aha. Aha. And uh, uh, kind of intuition, you're actually saying that like all the three attributes? 
No, 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 no. I, all I say is, uh, uh, all I say is, uh, he complains that I, I tell you the whole story. I was uh, sitting in my office and he and I read uh, that is, he says uh, the, the the translations are not good. So then I had to go to the colloquium. There was statistics, so I didn't understand anything. And I said to myself, what can he mean by this? He certainly does not need a translation from Latin into uh, Italian or French. He can do that, and I, he certainly could also read Greek. I'm sure at that time. So. It, so then I said, it can only be something that the translation is very bad. And then I looked more into it. I, another example, I, this, uh, this uh, Willem van Moerbeke, that was what he did was fantastic. For instance, Ptolemaeus uh, was translated like this, first into Syrian, then into Arab, and then into Toledo. They had an Arab guy who spoke the local dialect, and he told that someone in Toledo and he translated into Latin. So you can imagine that was, uh, that was sometimes a very complicated business. And uh, so, but it is conceivable that he, that he read this, but no, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. But, but uh, Morbeke translated from the Greek to yes. Latin. Yes, yes, directly, that was the point. That was the point. And, uh, the, yeah. And he probably had that in script as a disappeared. Yes, I think so. I think so. I, I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of uh, things have, uh, yeah, uh, uh, are gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. This palimpsest you have probably uh, heard is now it was auctioned in New York and there is this big, uh, uh, the, uh, now it is a, uh, a big topic. Uh, by chance, the, the vice director of this museum in Baltimore uh, is a German and she became director in Hannover and the first thing she did, she took three pages, three sheets from this uh, palimpsest and exhibited them in, uh, in, in Hildesheim, in Hildesheim. So I drove all the way to Hildesheim to look at it. Uh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Could one see anything? Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, in this, you, you, must, you, you must see this handwriting is already, this is, not like, this is not like what I showed you, the Greek I showed you. This handwriting, this is uh, hard to read. Once a, a German historian gave a lecture upon that, he said it was written this green ink to it reconstructed, and then the green ink deteriorated. Aha. Uh, has to remove the green ink. Yes, yes. Has to look. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's the microscope. Yes. I just wonder whether you can see anything. Well, I think I, I can. I saw something, but uh, yeah. But uh, Heiberg immediately recognized. He, it was told. He was told. I mean, I don't know the name. One one manuscript page is in Cambridge, and it came to Cambridge because one professor of theology was there. He was looking over for biblical manuscripts. He saw that. Took out one. Tear out one page, took the vision, showed it to Ivar, said, "Look, this is a good thing." So this, <laughs> so this is still in, in Cambridge. And then Heiberg went to Constantinople, and he had photographs. And from this photograph, uh, he reconstructed it. But you see, there's uh, I, when you when you look at the when you look at it, it is only. Oh no, there is. This is the first page of the critical edition by Heiberg. You see, the, the Latin, the Greek text goes only up to this, and then he continues with some opaque, because he has not, nothing else. He could not read more. And also, they, they, took, uh, they took the codex of Archimedes, and then they folded it over. So then there is something lost in the middle, and so on. Yeah, so it's complicated to, <laughs> to, to do that. Yeah, OK. Thank you.